Uh, it is my great uh, privilege to introduce the next two speakers uh, who will be talking about theory. They are both MIT professors. Professor Peter L. Hagelstein will be first on the list, and then we have uh, Professor Keith Johnson from the uh, Department of Material Science. Professor Hagelstein is in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. In fact, on the third issue of uh, the Cold Fusion magazine that I edited, as I said, P P Peter's layman's attempt at a layman's explanation of his neutron transfer reactions uh, occurred. And I think he did a, a very good job. If we had more time to work on it, I think we would have, we would have gotten it through. But uh, uh, in, in an even more clear fashion, and we needed some space for graphs. And maybe in the future, we can do that layman's thing. But Peter has been involved in coal fusion since the earliest of days as a real pioneer. Uh, I think around, it was April 14th, 1989, when the news office at which I worked found out about the fact that he was burning the midnight oil in those crazy days of the, of the uh, coal fusion er era to come up with a theory. And since then, he's perfected this theory. And now he tells me it's right on the money and the fingers of God are pointing to it. But of course, the other theorists say that too. But even if Peter were wrong, which of course one has to doubt with credentials like Peter has, um, uh, it's very, very exciting that someone of his intellect can put together diverse ideas into a framework to try to explain this. It's very much in the spirit, by the way, of Julian Schwinger, who said, well, I don't know if cold fusion is real in the early days. Peter and I know that it's real, that the phenomena are real. But Schwinger said, look, suppose we just say, how could this happen? How could you have nuclear reactions in a lattice? And he went to speculate and formulate theories. Uh, I think Peter was very much in that same uh, spirit. So without further ado, let's have Peter Hagelstein come on down and get on the firing line. And I promise you, he, he has the, uh, a reputation for high density of equations. <laughs> But, but that is, that's all to the good because it, it, with these <coughs> densities of equations, you know he must be right. Uh, Gene asked me to uh, figure out a title for my talk. And I suggested, well, it'd be fun to talk about cold fusion, what we know and what we don't know. And uh, I made up a view graph, something like this. And I was thinking about it in that uh, uh, that's a uh, pretty hoity-toity kind of title because in the cold fusion business, there's a lot of different people, and there's a lot of different people that have a lot of different point of views. And what some people know isn't the same thing as some, what other people know. And uh, that will become especially a, a uh, pointed uh, when you listen to my talk and when you listen to Keith Johnson's talk, and if you listen to any other theorist's talk in the business, because we all have different uh, points of view. And so I'd like to offer the correction. My first uh, view graph is uh, this should say cold fusion. Uh, what I think I know and <laughs> what I think I don't know. <laughs> uh, it would be nice to be able to represent the views of the cold fusion community, scientific community or something, but there's no consensus uh, uh, of any interest here. Um, let's see, if there are going to be cold fusion effects uh, and if you're going to try to account for the cold fusion effects from the point of view of theory, the very first uh, problem you've got to deal with is one of energy transfer. And you might imagine when I uh, first started in this, I talked to some of my students. My students said, well, it's a hard problem. How do you get, how do you figure out hard problems and stuff? Where they said, well, it's kind of like you might be here and you're trying to get there and you don't have a map. So you're a pioneer. You get to go and you get to try all the things and build up your own map. And in the end, if you actually get there, then you can write back home and say how you did it. And so to some degree, what I've done is to take a few of the uh, issues and a few of the ideas and try to indicate what some of the branch points uh, in the map are from a point of view of a theorist. Um, if you're going to transfer energy, uh, the nuclear uh, levels are separated typically by uh, tens to hundreds of KeV, even MeV. And the lattice uh, has energy levels that are measured in units of uh, milli-EV, tens of milli-EV. If you're going to transfer a large amount of energy, I guess I'm thinking in terms of heat production. I'm thinking in terms of tritium production. I'm thinking in terms of light water. I'm thinking in terms of heavy water experiments. I'm thinking in terms 
of uh, transmutations or uh, other claims. Uh, this argument, some of you might say, well, it presupposes that there exists an effect, or maybe we don't have to presuppose there exists an effect. Let's just speculate. If there is going to be an effect, what do you have to do and how's it going to work? <coughs> anyway, either you can take one of two routes. You can transfer your energy, uh, small units of quantum energy at a time, which is what the lattice would like to see. Or you could try transferring the energy one large quantum at a time, which is what the nuclei would like to see if you're going to speak uh, to the nuclear energy levels. So you have your, your first branch point, and you have to make a decision as to which way to go. Of course, in my case, I went both routes because it wasn't obvious to me. In fact, I thought going many small quanta was the sure way to do the job. But the issue is uh, fairly straightforward, actually. Uh, Gene's accused me of writing down too many equations, and he's right. <laughs> but uh, the basic issue is that if you're going to transfer many small quanta, then in your reaction rate formulas, you get uh, very high order terms showing up. Uh, if you're going to transfer only one large quanta, then you get a low order term. And uh, low order terms, high order terms, the issue is that the interaction strength has to be on the order of the energy transfer. Namely, you have to have an interaction strength on the order of MeV to transfer an MeV with any finite rate. When all is said and all is done, that's hard. <coughs> if you could figure out how to transfer large energy quanta, uh, you could do it with a 10 or 12 orders of magnitude smaller interaction matrix element. Basically, whatever effect is going on here is likely to be a sort of a minor effect. Otherwise, folks would have seen it before. So it's probably going to be small. Uh, an effect that would have an interaction matrix element that would be on the order of MeV would be bigger than any interaction matrix element for anything that's ever been observed in condensed matter by lots of orders of magnitude. So when all said and all is done, even though the reasoning and logic are simple enough, it only took six months or so of calculating to, <laughs> to prove this uh, uh, and, and be sure. I, I, actually, the basic issue is you needed to come up with a mechanism to transfer the large amount of money, or er, uh, energy, not money. <laughs> You wouldn't be so kind as to back up the tape there. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so far, I, I can attest that, that there has actually not been any uh, large transfers of money <laughs> to, to my program. Uh, OK. If you've selected one large quanta, then you face the uh, uh, next issue, that if you're determined to transfer a large quantum of energy, you need some mechanism to interact with the lattice. And interacting with the lattice, uh, to some degree, is rather clear. Lattices have been around for a long time, and folks have been considering the physics of lattices for a long time. There's two basic types of interaction. There's a simple recoil, or there's a, a mode shifting. Uh, you can, to some degree, take all of uh, the theoretical work with respect to energy transfer to and from lattice. And uh, simplistically, when you get down to the interaction with the phonons, you can split them up into these two basic uh, mechanisms. The 